Hi, I'm Rachel, and welcome to my NaNoWriMo 2023 Week 4 vlog. Coming out of Week 3 is a bit of a doozy. A lot was going on that week, culminating with something I've been looking forward to for a long time. I got to watch the Hunger Games prequel adaptation, and I, I liked the movie. I liked the movie a lot, but I wasn't absolutely head over heels for it the way I was for all the other films, and that's kind of freaking me out, but... Don't worry, I'm working through it with my NaNoBlogMo post. <laughs> and now I gotta move on into a new week, new week of NaNo, new week of life. This is uh, Thanksgiving week in uh, the US, meaning that I actually have a shortened work week, but actually the days I am working are jam so jam-packed full of things that I think it's gonna feel like a full work week as it is. <laughs> But yeah, in the middle of the week, I'll be uh, with my uh, family in uh, Baltimore County for a few days celebrating the holiday and hopefully getting some words in along the side. And then hopefully uh, I will be back here over the weekend where, you know, pounding out words will be my primary concern. <laughs> but of course, I won't be waiting till the weekend to continue with my writing. I'm coming into week four slightly behind, less than a hundred words behind, but still slightly behind, uh, and, uh, you know, the, you know, ticker keeps going, 1667 per day, no matter what, and, uh, as usual, I will be going after work today to my writer salon, where I will be tackling chapter 36 of my fantasy project which is something I said for the entirety of last week. Uh, and as much as I don't want to penalize myself for, you know, what I do or don't get through specifically in terms of the writing, so long as I get words, uh, you know, it feels a bit awkward <laughs> to say the same thing over and over again. So I really am hoping that this is the time when I will be finishing up that chapter and then in future updates, I'll have new things to talk about in terms of the progression of my fantasy novel. And I'll be con continuing to do other, uh, you know, rebel work as well, as is my custom. But yeah, uh, I'm hopeful, optimistic that I have a lot more writing on my plate that I could get done to get these words out. Uh, and that it'll be an awesome fourth week of vlogging. So I'm sitting here with the book I chose for my page 112 tag this month. This is the Souvenir Museum by Elizabeth McCracken. It's a book of short stories, and not the only book of short stories I have by this author. I got a collection signed at the National Book Festival uh, some years ago. But speaking of writing in books, uh, this one has uh, some really uh, nifty writing in it uh, from its last user. It's kind of filled with notes, but the one that interests me the most is the one at top here. It's a review copy, because this book is an ARC. Uh, uh, pass it on. I loved these, but it's one book in, one book out. And I just kind of love the romanticism of this. I mean, like a lot of booktubers, I acquire books for my shelves that stay there. But Although I do also try to get rid of some books for, you know, spacing issues, if nothing else. And I love the idea of a community of passing it on. And, you know, I've been... Uh, taking clips in these vlogs of uh, putting books into my uh, li free little library that my writing salon has outside. So uh, it's just kind of exciting to me to think that once I finish this collection of short stories, I can go ahead, uh, uh, pass it on and put it in there. And I know somebody will likely pick it up pretty soon because uh, the collection in that little free library tends to shift pretty quickly. So yeah, I just love feeling like I'm in part of the romanticism of the book reading world. I am I am curious, now that we're talking about music and, <laughs> and bars, um, I, I'm curious if you'll have like a specific writing playlist you use. Like, do you like writing to music or with some other kind of background noise? Or are you the kind of person who needs to have like absolute silence when you're writing? Yeah, what is, very, what, is, what is your writing soundscape look like, or sound like? <laughs> um, I know for me, it's even, uh, okay, I can't do lo-fi, because lo-fi reminds me of school, but I can do synth plays, and that's usually what I have. <laughs> and if I play music, um, and if I'm not playing music, I'll still just have my headphones in. And usually it's because I forgot to put on music, but I think some 
thing about putting your head on so it's just like really focused on me. So yeah. I love that. I do that sometimes too, even when I'm when I'm like picking a walk or something, I'll a lot of times I'll be listening to a podcast and then if the episode ends I'll just keep walking but leave my head mm-hmm. in. Um <laughs> playlist but always wind up with some random song I listen to on repeat even though it doesn't fit the theme. <laughs> this year it's Dead Girl Walking from the Heather's musical. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, I, I, I salute anyone who has several playlists going on and it's like tailored for like the mood of the story or like the setting because I'm like I could not <laughs> That's really it's, cool. It's so cool. It's so cool. It's like it's like a you know like I don't know people who do do a whole themed playlist when they're like leading a D and D campaign or something. I'm like, oh man, that's so much. That's so much work. It's so good. But, um, I also salute Sarah Dooley who says this year I'm writing to the sound of my child's Rick and Morty blaring through their bedroom wall. I'm sure that's having an effect on this. Oh my story. gosh. So anybody who's writing with the background noise of like a child or a housemate <laughs> doing their own thing. I see. I don't think there's like a common music because I'll see like heavy metal, classical, maybe new folk music, um, nature sounds earlier, mm. video game music. Like, <laughs> it's so cool to see what everyone's doing. Also, um, this reminded me, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard like video game music is actually like really good for writing because like, it's like designed or like composed to like be something you listen to while you're like, doing tasks. Cause like, think about how games work. <laughs> huh. Well, okay, maybe not the fight music. But... Okay, yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like it would be a very different experience if I, if I do it to like, <laughs> running around picking stuff up in the grass uh, video game music versus the like here's yeah the- so I'm waiting for my dad to pick me up. He's grabbing me for Thanksgiving where I'll be spending it at my parents' house in Baltimore County. And I could harp on the fact that I'm still in chapter 36 of my fantasy novel, but instead I'll say something more specific to be more interesting. <laughs> I currently am working on a scene um, that takes place at a secondary character's home. Uh, she lives in this uh, uh, compound with her family. Where, and uh, my main character and a bunch of her peers are en route for the capital because of some uh, major religious turnover. And so politically things are a little bit like uneasy, like what's happening, what's the future going to be? And my main character is kind of showing up this secondary character at her home. And the secondary character's kind of volatile and doesn't appreciate being shown up. And so I'm on the cusp of a scene where she, con- the secondary character confronts my main character, but I'm thinking about the scene I just wrote and about how volatile she already is in that scene and that it, should I cut it back a little bit? Is it too over the top? Especially if I want a scene where, you know, there's a confrontation. I don't want it to seem like same old, same old. And I guess this is the sort of thing that keeps me from moving quickly (laughs) through my chapters because I keep writing and rewriting things, trying to make them seem okay. I just, you know, in my my outlining, I just don't get to this amount of granular detail until I actually get into the chapter, I guess. Uh, So yeah, I'm on uh, my major uh, conundrum is, should I rewrite that scene or should I just keep going forward for now? Uh, You know, with Nano, at least the way I'm doing it, all words count anyway. There's no reductions. <laughs> but at the same time, I don't know. Well, for, certainly for the vlog, it's more fun to, you know, make forward motion and talk about new things. <laughs> but, you know, that's not why I'm writing. I'm not writing for the vlog. I'm writing this for myself. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I guess ultimately I'll sit down and uh, decide just what feels right in the moment, uh, since all words count anyway. Um, and I'll report back. Uh, other than that, we're in a, th- a holiday weekend now, so I have some more free time, but other time of with spending with family, so having to do the seesaw of that 
and I'll be away from my usual environs for a few days, but uh, I am looking forward to seeing everyone and eating some good food and uh, catching up. It should be a uh, good weekend, I think. Baltimore area at my parents house and I got to be quiet filming because my uh, four-year-old uh, cousin is asleep in the room next to me so yeah I gotta maybe be a little quiet and quick here to talk about this book with a banged up cover perhaps another uh, contender for the free little library but anywho this was and after the fire by Lauren Belfer one of the books that has been on my Goodreads TBR for so many years it reached the top of my list this year historical fiction about uh, a subset of uh, Holocaust studies that uh, intrigues me, or Holocaust fiction, I should say, about um, pilfered art or pilfered music, in this case, uh, completely fictionalized, but uh, still in that uh, milieu. Uh, so in this uh, story, uh, actually the historical uh, part starts in the late 18th century when uh, the uh, real-life uh, son of Johann Sebastian Bach gives his real-life student, a, a Jewish woman named uh, Sarah Levy, um, one of uh, his father's uh, cantatas, which uh, is fictional, but in you know the story it's real. And in the cantata, it's a, a polemic that he wrote for religious reasons for a Methodist, uh, you know, church service with, you know, very virulent anti-Jewish sentiments about, you know, we should have murdered them all sort of thing. And uh, so the son feels bad about this to a degree because he knows that, you know, if this music were to actually be given to a church, it could incite real violence against Jews. And because he has he loves this student who happens to be Jewish, he doesn't want that to happen, so he uh, gives the cantata to her to uh, hide, and it follows a lot of real-life Prussian and German history, uh, and people in her family, mostly, who, uh, you know, their exploits, like, for example, she was related to uh, Felix and Fanny Mendelssohn, uh, who were also famous uh, classical composers, well, Felix Mendelssohn was anyway, and a lot of, you know, the German German and Jewish history of the time, and, you know, the cantata uh, moving from, you know, person to person. And then meanwhile, uh, you know, jump to the end of uh, World War II with the prologue of this book when an American uh, Jewish soldier 
finds the manuscript in an abandoned mansion uh, and uh, brings it home with him and keeps it secret. He, you know, is fluent in German, so he knows about the anti-Semitic polemic of it. And uh, when he dies in 2010, which is the secondary uh, present-day storyline, his uh, niece finds it, or he, he maybe bequeaths it to her, something like that. Uh, and she gets in touch with uh, scholars of Bach and uh, to try to figure out how best to handle this situation. And so it's one of those stories that moves back and forth, like um, we get the narrative of where the, you know, cantata goes from place to place, person to person, really, uh, as they're slowly trying to figure it out in the present day and also deal with a bunch of other stuff. You know, they, this uh, woman, Susanna, and uh, the two scholars she's most involved with, Scott and Dan, they have some backstory stuff going on that, of course, they have to deal with, and then there's a romance that crops up, and then there's also a whole lot of research into, you know, the study of classical music and the study of Bach's biography and also just the, you know, the, the archives and repositories and everything that these uh, academics use to keep the classics and the musical classics field alive, which is fascinating in and of itself, but I feel like the author really over relied on it uh, in her storytelling, like she was a little too, you know, in love with her research. And, you know, it's one of those things where for historical fiction, sometimes, you know, the amount of research you do is supposed to be under the, the water of the iceberg, not at the top, you know, and I feel like she put too much at the top. Uh, as fascinating as it was, you know, it's not supposed to be a research paper for us to read. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's still a really fascinating story. I kind of feel like overall that, you know, you can tell it's kind of, you know, this is the snob in me talking. It's kind of genre, plot first sort of writing. The characters are okay, but, you know, it's not too deep. Uh, and especially because she's focusing on too many of them. She's, you know, popping into too many heads. And I guess I have mixed feelings about it. Like, I kind of, I don't know, I think she should have... Uh, uh, well, certainly stuck with Susanna and what Susanna's going through, uh, she, uh, with her family, well, she's going through a lot on her own, like, this character does have a pretty rich life on her own, like, with what she's trying to accomplish at her job, and she's trying to get over the trauma of, um, sexual assault in her past, and, uh, then she has Holocaust family history to unravel and her grandfather's uh, GI family history to unravel. So that's enough on its own. And then, uh, though I get kind of why Belfer also wanted to go into these German-American Methodist characters who were kind of going to grapple with the fact that, you know, Bach and their religion uh, could be so anti-Semitic sometimes. Uh, and I think that's like an interesting, you know, character study to go into, but, you know, I don't know how much is, you know, y y you stretch too much over a book and it's just kind of too thin. Uh, so, uh, I don't know I, where I, exactly I come down on that line. Maybe I'll come to more realizations as I write my review, as I often do. There were a few other characters beyond that scope that maybe we didn't need to, you know, be in the spotlight at all. They really should have just stayed secondary. But yeah, uh, overall, I do feel like uh, in terms of a story, it really kept my attention, and I was very impressed with the historical research, and I feel like this is the sort of uh, insight into the Holocaust that, uh, that interests me the most right now, reading about it from this uh, vantage point of broader history and also artistic uh, history and learning more about Bach, you know, warts and all. Pretty much a month late with this, but I'm finally posting my Victober video at long last. I finished 
reading and reviewing Daniel Deronda by George Eliot and uh, Reuben Sachs by Amy Levy and rambled out a bunch of thoughts about them. And now I can finally add this video to my October literary newsletter as well, now that it exists or will in the next few minutes. Good morning. I am back in Silver Spring after my uh, Thanksgiving half week with my family in Baltimore County. Uh, and we are rounding out the final weekend of NaNoWriMo. And in all honesty, I don't really want to sit here and pontificate that much because mostly I'm feeling a lot of burnout, which is not a great feeling to be feeling. I really am dedicated to finishing this project and trying to think up something optimistic to say at this point probably won't be as helpful as getting my butt in the chair and starting to type. So that's where my headspace is right now. I do think I'm going to head into the shower and get some groceries and my usual weekend chores of a sort and then... Uh, hopefully put my pedal to the metal and not worry about things much beyond that. Uh, and yeah, my uh, thoughts are with everybody in the trenches with me. Anybody else experiencing any sort of burnout with uh, NaNoWriMo? And uh, hopefully we'll see each other on the other side. I am planning to go out uh, this afternoon for my second and final NaNoWriMo write-in. Here we are again with an event page. This one is in D.C. at a, another D.C. local bookstore, D Little District Books. Uh, and uh, like the one a couple of weeks ago, uh, there's a, a lot of people uh, who are signed up. So I'm hoping, I guess, that there might be a fair amount of turnout. You know, we're at the point now where, uh, like I said, people are, you know, getting burnout and uh, maybe dropping out or, you know, not being as involved with the community, but I guess we can hope for the best uh, and that at least a few people will show up and I'll get some good writing in. So, yeah, this is basically what I use the website for. Uh, I use it to, you know, track my stats and to interact with the local community. Uh, and it's something I've been thinking about because, uh, you know, Years ago, I really stopped using the forums other than uh, the local community to try to, you know, keep on top of, you know, where the write-ins were and all that. Uh, I found the rest of the forums to be completely overwhelming. And then, you know, the changeover to the new system a couple years ago just confused me the way the forums are set up. So I was kind of floored, really, when uh, we got the email from the board a couple of uh, weeks ago about... Uh, the forums being suspended and that there were so many problems, uh, especially for, uh, for the young writers in YWP, that, you know, there were a lot of unresolved moderator complaints and uh, more damningly that uh, some uh, kids apparently uh, were being led by a mod to uh, an adult uh, website. Uh, so uh, I was floored that all of this was going on for months and because I basically see Nano as like a little you know, cottage community or a little village within the larger community, this wasn't part of my nano experience at all. And it's just so sad to think of uh, how this has come down and that there is a lot of anger uh, and mistrust at the moment toward, you know, leadership. Uh, this is my nano involvement right here on the DC page. And, uh, you know, it makes me think nostalgically back to when I joined 20 years ago and, you know, it was Chris Beatty and a shoestring uh, staff and, you know, all of the social interaction like on Viddler felt like so experimental and so small and contained and all of that. And I guess part of me thinks that maybe this is the negative side effect of how big Nano has gotten that just seems like so unfortunate that, you know, some sort of horrible controversy like this would have to come up. Uh, and, you know, I can't sit here and wish that Nano weren't as big and that it weren't reaching as many people as it is. I ardently hope that most people are actually getting something good out of this, but just my understanding is is that uh, Nano wasn't, uh, the leadership wasn't really up to the challenge, and I really hope uh, they're doing what they can right now to fix it, because I would hate for, the, you know, this negative controversy about, you know, especially about endangering young people to be the legacy of Nano. That's just really, really sad to me. So here's just putting out my two cents of hope into the future that, uh, you know, that uh, next year we'll all be in a better place. And that meanwhile, you know, our little villages within the greater community, uh, hopefully for most people, like for me, they continue to be a place uh, of uh, inspiration and connection to one another throughout this month.
So the in-person write-in tonight was pretty well attended, uh, which was kind of surprising and uh, happy. It, it took place, you know, after, you know, the sun goes down and it was a cold and rainy night, so kind of something that, you know, almost 20 of us made it into uh, this little bookstore after hours where they very graciously uh, removed some of their inventory from some of the tables and, you know, set them up with some folding chairs and we got to writing for two hours. And at last I can finally say that I am past chapter 36 of my fantasy novel. Uh, the way I ended it, I feel like, you know, I went all over the place and I overwrote, uh, uh, but probably that's better than underwriting, that I have to sculpt something out of too much material rather than too little in the future. Hopefully that'll be how it works out. And indeed, uh, I then moved on to a skeleton of chapter 37, something I talked about in earlier vlogs where it's kind of a uh, mix of uh, notes and some drafting, and it's far from complete, but it's my best way of actually hammering through words quickly, because now, of course, we are really in the crunch time. I am wrapping up my final official week of vlogging, and I just have a couple of days left before this whole shebang is over, so really, I need every trick in the book I can get to make it to the end. Uh, at least, uh, you know, sitting there with my fellow Rhymos. Uh, for this event, I was far from the only person who was behind, uh, but we're all feeling pretty good. It's nice that there's still this much morale uh, among the community at this time. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, maybe I'll even get to see them again for a, uh, you know, thank God it's over party at the end, but let's not, you know, get too ahead of ourselves. Uh, all I can do for now, uh, as I wrap it up here and uh, move into this uh, final few days, is, uh, you know, just keep my pedal to the metal. And I'll hopefully be able to do some stuff with this, you know, fast drafting skeleton tra chapter stuff. And I got my final rebel stuff to squeeze in. And I'm kind of hopeful, even at a little bit of a disadvantage, I think 50k can still be in sight and things will proceed as normal. So congratulations to everyone who's won, and for everyone still in the trenches with me, we can do this. Heading into the nano finale final days, and I'm on the badges part of my project, and there is no getting away from the captain obvious fact that I should be awarding myself one particular badge. Ta-da! Here it is! It's the nano rebel badge! Feeling pretty happy that obviously it's a popular enough option that uh, it's not just me taking part in it, but here we go. Now my profile feels more complete. <laughs>